I? Rage 2 is weird. No, like, really weird. And not even in any of the ways that they meant for it to be. It's an amalgam of obvious inspirations that have been replicated with varying degrees of success, stuck between styles with its attempts to inject horror, drama, and existential threats into a wacky world where you're not supposed to take anything seriously, a fact that approximately a third of its characters seem to understand. And it had a frankly huge advertising campaign that made it seem incredible, only to sell a quarter of the physical launch week copies of its predecessor, a game that I have previously never heard of. And even just looking at the trailers for that game, we can maybe see why. It appears to be a less wild look at the post-apocalypse, clearly drawing from the early 2010s mega-properties Fallout and Borderlands, though seemingly without any of the humorous tendencies that those two famously strive for. Unfortunately for Rage, it was sandwiched between the two best examples of why this little corner of the gaming industry was so huge, and as such, nobody actually remembers that it exists. It certainly didn't spawn a hyper franchise with a litany of sequels, or even really light any fires commercially or critically speaking, despite somehow garnering a number of awards that seems disproportionate to its actual reception. So now, desperate to join the ranks of those that had culturally outperformed them, the boys over at id, who were suddenly enjoying the mid-2010s resurgence offered by the Wolfenstein and Doom reboots, vowed to make the funniest, strangest, zaniest game of all time a tour de force that would wield the comedy of the open world post-apocalyptic genre's more iconic titles as its own weapon, forged in the fires of b being the only company who can make first-person shooters that aren't desperately scrambling to resemble the golden era of Call of Duty. But instead of that sensational masterpiece, what they what they got was, was Rage 2. Uh, I mean, look at it. They went absolutely insane. I have never seen a franchise lose its mind in quite so few entries as this one. It took precisely one game to go from post-apocalyptic oppression narrative to weird jorts commercial that practically tripped over its umbilical cord trying to be Borderlands 2. And that had some unusual effects on the tone of the game if you tried to isolate any one factor. For instance, human life in Rage 1 has purpose and value. To live is to overcome the wasteland and implement ideas of safety and justice, creating something meaningful out of a world in which death means so little, and humanity as a whole means nothing. In Rage 2, we get much the opposite, as even people watching their friends having their heads bitten off by giant mutants seem to react as though they were viewing something wholly inconsequential. So much for Ranger Jersey. <laughs> ah. But it's still got a lot of Jersey in it. It's like, in adopting the grim wasteland comedy of those two games that I keep mentioning, they had to entirely reverse the philosophy of what this wasteland means, which perhaps says something about the companies chasing a profit, but to be fair, it might also just reflect a love for Handsome Jack's spoon speech. This jackal rushes me with a spoon. <laughs> a freaking spoon, and I'm dying laughing, right? So I scoop out his stupid little eyeballs with it, and his kids are all wah! And said comedy also contributes to the strangeness, as Rage 2 suffers from the same problem as many of my videos. Most of the jokes aren't nearly as funny as the person writing them likes to think. And when you have a title that's working hard to embed itself amongst the elites of the funny wasteland games, that's kind of huge. It never quite nails the morbid humour of entries of similar settings and in-your-face wacky vibes, so the tone is a nightmarish concoction that you can't quite grasp, slipping through your hands like an eel. This strangeness all means that Rage 2 is a surprisingly unique experience for a game that took so much from so many others. But is it actually any good? Well, bizarrely that's actually the oddest part of all, other than maybe the $120 collector's edition with the singing severed mutant head that haunts my dreams. Because, maybe more than any other example that I can think of, it manages to be both very good and pretty dire at the exact same time. How? You probably didn't ask? Well, ask away. Because either way, I'm going to do my best to explain. So, first things first, how does it actually feel playing Rage 2? Pretty phenomenal, actually. As I've said, it's refreshing to play another shooter that more resembles Doom and certain elements of Machine Games' Wolfenstein titles, and, like those games, a huge part of Rage's gameplay is the pure power fantasy. It's bloody and over the top, and you can whiz around exploding people into gory showers of bodily bits without really losing any health. 
the guns genuinely kick when they fire and half of the time aiming means that you're doing it wrong. This all works as a treat, and beyond a couple of notable exceptions, it's the most awesome that you'll feel playing an FPS released at any point throughout the past 10 years. This is partially due to the gunplay, but it also lies within the mechanic of picking up health from your fallen enemies, which looked somewhat familiar to our friends over at demonslaying.gov, even having health pickups springing out of the juicy meat pinata cannon fodder foes in glowing blue shards like in Bethesda's other four letter title. It's a great way to get you to engage in combat, creating a different experience as, unlike in so many games where going down to low health means that you should take cover, or you're actually driven towards close combat and taking on your enemies even more ferociously than before. This in turn means that the fighting in Rage is more dynamic, and you shouldn't ever sit at a distance taking pot shots to reduce the risk of entering a combat situation as you might in other titles. In fact, to do so would be actively detrimental to your chances, as the temporary nature of the health shards that your enemies drop means that you need to be in the thick of it, up close and personal, to pick up any health throughout the course of the combat. However, whereas Doom ramps up the difficulty with tougher, more dynamic enemies of a wide range of classes and complexities, requiring you to switch weapons and playstyles depending on what you're fighting, Rage just lets you run around with the same couple of guns for the whole game, mowing down static fiends in a title that never really challenges you, or makes you think in the vein of Doom Eternal, which was described by game director Hugo Martin as The thinking man's action game. Sure, you could mix it up by going out of your way to find a lot more than just a handful of weapons, so perhaps that's not a fair element of this wider criticism. But equally, I was in something of a rush to get through the game after the first few hours of side mission mayhem. And I'll explain why in a little while. As a result of this lack of enemy difficulty or diversity, you can just sort of pinball your way around picking up health from your enemies, and there's really no risk of dying in any mission that features the game's standard enemy infantry, let alone the dozens and dozens that are entirely populated by those grunts, who are effectively just health packs with a few extra steps. This is perhaps best demonstrated by the fact that I, a man who is terrible at video games, never once died to Rage 2's combat, only actually falling dead at any point due to my severe bouts of idiocy and non-violent situations. And whilst there's some value to the realisation of that power fantasy, and those kind of missions certainly are nice every now and then, I think it's also the main reason why we get possibly the most prominent popular criticism of Rage 2, that its world starts to wear thin very, very quickly. If each mission were a challenge and there was genuine difficulty to taking down enemy bases or mutant hordes, if you had to plan ahead and consider your approach for each type of mission, the events dotted around the open world map would seem exciting and interesting every time. As it is, I had to resort to dumb nonsense like committing to only using melee attacks, or trying to empty entire settlements using only the weapons on my vehicle, just to chase the sadly elusive high of the moments when I was discovering Rage 2's otherwise remarkable combat for the first time. Alas, those highs begin to fade away as you progress through the game, and though they're never necessarily gone for good, they certainly become less frequent as you near the latter stages of the story. Remember when I said that I wanted to finish Rage as quickly as possible? Probably it, it, it wasn't that long ago. But that's because Rage 2 very quickly gets boring. When I first started the game and caught a glimpse of the huge map that was on offer, I saw it as a sign that there would be loads to do, with tons of areas to explore, and a wide range of activities to keep me occupied as I levelled up and occasionally dipped into its main story. And at first, that was what I got, and I was grinning ear to ear. However, the size of the map soon became something of a burden. You see, you get these three main mission threads at the start of the game, and they're situated quite far away from where you start out, as well as from one another. And that's no big deal, until you realise that those are three of the only places in the entire wasteland that you can fast travel between. You therefore have to drive this kind of clunky, always slow seeming vehicle back and forth across a vast and monotonous set of sparsely populated landscapes, heading between side missions that, though excellent in small doses, never really extend beyond kill the people, find the loot, except for in the instances when one of those aspects is missing. You're trundling along to the same mission over and over, and although it's great fun, there's a point where you stop and ask yourself if you've already seen everything that Rage has to offer. For me, it was about a quarter of the way through the game, and I did complete the game, and I did enjoy it a lot, but I couldn't get over that feeling that very little was being offered in the way of interesting additions to the player's experience. 
A helpful comparison might be the world of Red Dead Redemption 2, which is perhaps a bit unfair given what went into that game, but Red Dead also has really limited fast travel, takes twice as long to travel across on your vehicle, is a much longer game, and came out at a similar time, with the same gap between itself and the original title as with Rage and Rage 2. Nonetheless, Arthur Morgan never seems to run out of things to do even as he too rides between missions, cursing the lack of fast travel options under his breath. There are random encounters, great showcases of environmental storytelling, and hundreds of species of animal to track down, lure in, kill, skin, sell, and make a fancy hat out of. It's dense, and even the changes in climate seem much more frequent and extreme than those in Rage's Desert Wasteland. Sure, the post-apocalyptic title does offer these fights by the side of the road every now and then, and they can be fun, though very, very brief and you also get the convoys to attack with your car, but that basically consists of holding down the accelerator minigun buttons for 5 minutes as you follow a lorry and occasionally dodge an attack, not really offering anything new, either visually or in terms of gameplay. Like, yeah, the game is better off for having vehicular combat, but also, if I'm spending the majority of the title in that vehicle, and the only difference here is that I'm holding down one extra button, it's not really bringing that much to the table, is it? If there were more elements to it, then it would probably really lighten up those parts of the playthrough, but generally it's just a bit samey. There are at least races, which definitely spice things up a bit, but which also don't have checkpoints or any kind of limitation on how you can drive, making them really easy as long as you're facing the right way when they start, which is by no means a given. This, combined with the fact that they always take you well out of your way, which is particularly frustrating as you really only ever come across them when you're slowly making your way across the map to reach somewhere for a mission, means there's really no point or reward in completing street races, making this entire aspect of the game kind of defunct, just useless and unnecessary. On top of this, there are a bunch of strange failings in Rage 2 that seem entirely innocuous on their own, even appearing as though nothing is wrong in isolation, but which build up when all crammed together into one game. Perhaps the most prominent example of this in my reflections on the game is that in those open world moments when you walk up to a character and press the button to interact with them, they often explicitly seek a response that you just don't give them. What I mean by this is that, unlike those characters in similar games that just air their grievances or say they don't want to speak to you when you interact with them, Rage 2's NPCs are often very direct in their questioning, making your character's refusal to respond into some weird game of ignoring everyone, which, due to the other interactions in which the protagonist is very wordy, isn't even consistent with their character, as it would be with Master Chief or nearsighted protagonists along those lines, and the characters themselves, who are often very angry or otherwise emotionally invested in what you might say, also just stand there in the exact same way. So now they've asked if, for instance, you've avenged their recently murdered family, and you've just stared at them with no hint of a response or even recognition of what they've said, and then they've just stared back with the exact same silence and lack of movement as though you were both buffering. Every time this happened it detached me from the game, making it feel very inauthentic and, bizarrely, more like a version of that precedent that other games have established than those games themselves ever do. It made me aware that I was playing a game through this weird sense of parody, and thanks to years of training with titles in the same genre, I couldn't really stop interacting with people. It was a force of habit that it seemed like Rage was aware of, having given the option to interact with those characters in the first place, but which it never provided an adequate response for. Again, in isolation this is just a really annoying nitpick, but these kinds of things coagulate over the course of Rage, leaving it feeling a lot more shallow than the great work in other areas should do. For instance, it would have been easy to have the enemy NPCs just waiting around until you show up to fight, standing and doing nothing like in so many games with similar open world layouts and general premises. However, groups of mindless mutants, dumb raiders and elite mercenaries are always at war in the dark corners of the wasteland, creating a somewhat more dynamic world that benefits from feeling that a little bit more real, as though something's actually happening when you're not there. It reminds me of one time playing Fallout 4, when I was doing this one mission and had a bunch of elite raiders chasing me and accidentally ran past a building occupied by super mutants, whilst also attracting the attention of a series of feral ghouls. <laughs> The resulting mayhem had me clinging on for dear life and counting every bullet as these three factions engaged in battle, trying to progress towards my mission but also marvelling at these monumental collisions of parties in a game that otherwise offers very little of that, and I hate to use such a cliche, but little of that living, breathing world. 
Rage has this much more frequently, and not by some freak accident either, and yet the depth offered by that quality is only offset by the moments that remind you that this is a game that is designed to be played this way, and that you don't have any choice or agency or even really any impact upon what's happening on the screen. To be ridiculously sick form English student about it all, perhaps a better way to look at this would be through Keats's Hyperion, in which he writes, or shall the tree be envious of the dove because it cooeth and hath snowy wings to wander wherewithal and find its joys? There are moments of rage that almost feel like doves, able to sing and fly away and to reach the world and be the game that rage was always hoping to reach and to be. But rage isn't a dove, it's a tree that must be silent and can only ever grow so high and is tethered to gravity and to its weak identity that has sprouted roots that tie the game to the spot that it occupies in the medium. I think that that lack of identity is an interesting concept in a game that really nails its aesthetic and worked so hard to cut through the forest in a new direction for this series. But it's still there the whole time, perhaps owing to the cobbled together nature of inspirations that fully dictate rather than simply informing how the game should be going. It's not coy about its influences, instead feeling as though it's covering up and cowering away from a truth that, were it as funny or quirky or ironic as it wants us to believe, it would be wearing on its sleeve. Maybe the lack of identity is most subtly effective in the sections when you're driving, which, as I've mentioned, seems to take up most of the game, because instead of reverting to a predetermined location, the driving camera stays at whatever height it happened to be at when you last looked around using the right stick meaning that your entire experience of the environment around you, the scenery and the enemies on the road, which are all dictated by the camera angle, hence those chosen for games that want to show off the setting, like Mass Effect Andromeda, versus those that want to focus on vehicular combat, like Arkham Knight. That experience is fundamentally determined by a mechanic that you might not even notice exists until you're most of the way through the game. As such, there's no clear-cut identity, and every player's experience is different in the least inspired of ways. And last but not least, in the strange and unknowable order that I've been looking at things in this game, I want to give a little attention to the voice acting. Amanda Selina Miller is mostly pretty great throughout the game, though in certain cutscenes the acting in general felt a little bit strange, perhaps through a combination of the awkward script that means there are punchlines without setups, and occasional lines that seem like complete non sequiturs following on from what was said beforehand, which is perhaps why a small but noticeable number of deliveries from certain characters felt lost amidst the qualities of their counterparts, like Lucem Hager, who is characterised brilliantly by the inimitable Courtney Taylor, who unfortunately represents the unrivaled heights of the voice acting in Rage too. It's the same story as with almost every other element of the game. It manages to be brilliant in bits and uncomfortable in others, and there's very little consistency over which part adheres to which level of quality. All in all, it's difficult to concisely summarise the experience of Rage 2. It's a wonderful game trapped in its own subpar ideals, and it manages to smash the very nature of binary oppositions through fulfilling both ends of a series of qualities that I had once believed to be mutually exclusive. I'm not sure I can bring in any real conclusion here, which is why I've turned to a man that I can trust to save the day in this kind of scenario. He will know exactly what to say. So without further ado, I turn you to the man himself and his opinion on this strange, strange game. Sometimes it may be good, sometimes it may be shit. Seriously though, the surface look of a great game is what attracted me to Rage 2 back when it was first announced, and why I was so disappointed to see how it was reviewed. The game is better than most people say, but not as much as it looks from the great gunplay or the Mad Max style mayhem of its rally races and mutant mutilation and convoy combat. This will probably be one of my longest videos, and I've spent most of it highlighting the various problems with Rage, so it feels weird to recommend playing it after all that. But if it looks on the surface like your kind of thing, and you're able to get it for free on Game Pass or very cheap elsewhere, I'd definitely recommend at least playing it until you get bored. That might be sooner than anticipated, but until that moment, you'll likely be basking in the glory of the greatest bits that the game has to offer. And those can really be quite magical. Okay, so it's finally over. Thanks for watching this much of my madness, which probably turned away any actual fans of the game quite a long time ago. And if you liked watching this video, well, I'd really appreciate all of the usual YouTube-y vendor video things. And with that out of the way, I will see you next time.